This is one that's frankly ischemic and the IV contrast is particularly helpful here. So this is the efferent loop and you can see the wall is actually disrupted there. Again, the IV contrast really can help and there is plenty of peritoneal gas. So you weren't going to miss that certainly. There again, the peritoneal gas and this superior mesenteric artery, it is very small, but it is also occluded. And so always go and check these. Many of these cases have a little bit of a volvulus involved in them as well. And the primary problem could be ischemic rather than ulceration and perforation. So always check that SMA. That's one of the tiniest SMAs I've ever seen, but yet it's still not enhancing. So there is that efferent loop and you see the wall is just incomplete. That's a pretty easy one made easy by the presence of IV contrast in this case. All right, and now let's hope to pick up this SMA. It is incredibly small, but right there, and you can see it is not enhancing right in front of the renal vein there. All right, so this was a case of ischemia. There again, the perforation. And you can see that tiny SMA is in fact occluded. All right, uh, the mesenteric swirl, I thought it was worth just mentioning it. Uh, I find the definition of this of oh, 270 degrees, a complete uh, reversal of the positions of the SMA, SMV. I found when I go and try and apply those objective criteria, it's very difficult to say where exactly does this begin and how many, you know, how do I measure this? It's nice to try and put some objectivity on it, but it really didn't actually help me very much in looking at these. The bottom line is the swirl can take two forms. You can look at the mesenteric vessels and see if they're twisting one on the other. And you also can get a circular swirl appearance of bowel loops that are involved in an internal hernia. So the simple fact is look for both because it can be helpful, right? So this is a rotation. The specific definition of the swirl sign is the rotation of the mesenteric vessels into a spiral configuration. It can be present in normal patients or it can represent an internal hernia, right? Even in pe people who don't have a prior abdominal surgery. So you can see it in post-operative patients due to altered anatomic variables or barriers, and it may not indicate an internal hernia, and it is not always present in cases of post-operative internal hernia. However, you can see that it is in fact a fairly good indicator. So it's one you should definitely tune your eye to. And the bottom line is the authors of this article consider the mesenteric swirl to be the best indicator of an internal hernia, right? So it may not be perfect, but it certainly is worth noting. All right, so here we go. We have our staple line with gastric bypass surgery, and there is a circular loop of small bowel suggesting a bowel swirl, but there is also going to be a vascular swirl where the SMA and SMV turn on one, each, uh, one another. All right, so we'll look at all of this. There is the staple line. And we'll first look at the bowel swirl. See that it does two complete turns. That's definitely worth noting. But now let's track the vessels and they took a spin around one another. This is one that really needed both, right? Oral and intravenous contrast. In fact, when you look at the vessels, you can actually see the SMV is more dense than you would like to see, and it most likely is thrombosed. So this patient uh, suffered a terrible outcome. This was one of our med mal cases, and uh, this patient ended up losing a significant portion of their small bowel. So oral and IV contrast, I think would have helped here, probably the IV more than the oral, but certainly I would want both in interpreting that study. All right, another with gastric bypass surgery. And this time you can see the SMV and SMA will both snuff out. We can see it because we have intravenous contrast. 
So the SMV is lost and then just distal to that, the SMA will be lost. All right, so follow that SMV, there it went. Now pick up the SMA and there it went. Note also the cicatricial appearance of the small bowel. It's all being pulled together into one place suggestive of some version of a closed loop obstruction. There's also a great deal of wall thickening and intraperitoneal fluid distally. So this is one where the radiologist went on and on about, oh, kind of ill appearing bowel, but it was one of those uh, situations where there were a lot of notes from which no music was made. And so uh, that's one of my medical malpractice warnings too. When you find yourself dictating a two page report, but you haven't given a definitive one line diagnosis in the impression, you're probably missing something. And right there again, I really want to call your attention to that tethered appearance of the small bowel that suggests it's all being drawn into one place. Looks a little like uh, the prone disease case we saw the other day. Uh, and endometriosis cases we'll be seeing coming up. But in these, uh, is, these bariatric surgery patients, that suggests there's some kind of internal hernia around which everything is twisted. All right, uh, it's also worth noting that the SMV is your best indicator. I'm not suggesting that you only look at one vessel and <laughs> look at them both. But the SMV is going to be lower flow, lower pressure, thinner walls, and thus more susceptible to occlusion in these settings, right? So the SMV is probably your best indicator, and it's going to be the one that goes first. All right, another with bariatric clips, and this one, the SMV and SMA, will be snuffed out on the cine, these are pictures of the SMA and SMV. This was a very interesting case that I'll give you more detail on. So there are the bariatric clips. Watch that SMV, gone, SMA, gone. There's just a hint of a swirl to it, but the occlusion of those vessels is indisputable. So this was a funny one because we developed an AI algorithm having determined that SMA occlusion is one of the big medical malpractice contributors. So we developed AI algorithms to actually spot SMA occlusion. And this was the first day we were running that algorithm and I was responsible for reviewing these and up came this case, pretty incredible. So we called the ER, we got the patient back it had actually, because we were doing it uh, with next day follow-up when we first started our AI algorithms, it actually had been about 48 hours. I believe I called on a Monday morning. And so they called this patient back and took her straight to surgery instead of rescanning her, which is not something I thought I had to recommend. And they came back, called me and said, normal. <laughs> So uh, that doesn't dissuade me from calling those vessels occluded, but it just shows you you can't be right every time. Ultimately, I suspect what happened is this was somewhat volvulist. It had occluded those vessels and it simply turned back uh, in the interval between uh, the study and the surgery. All right, a couple afferent loop syndromes. So when you see massive dilation, of the native stomach, right? That is not supposed to be obstructed, obviously. And so that's an abnormal situation. We've got dilation of the stomach, but then there is that efferent loop coming out from the fundus and it is not dilated, right? You can see obviously the duodenum is dilated as well, as is all the proximal jejunum. So that's all afferent loop, right? And that's going to be reanastomosing with the small bowel more distally, which is most likely going to be the site of obstruction. So there goes that efferent loop and it's fine. See, it's anti-colic there, but then you've got all this dilated duodenum and proximal jejunum 
And the distribution of that dilation tells you that's the afferent loop that's obstructed. And you can see the point of obstruction just behind the efferent loop as we go down through here. Right there. All right, so that's afferent loop syndrome. Sometimes the afferent loop doesn't just dilate, it can also get ischemic if it's long standing enough, and that's what we have here. Not just dilated, but very thick walled, hypodense, and stranded. So this is afferent loop syndrome, but most likely with ischemia. And you can see a focal transition. So there's the mesenteric stranding. And then there is a focal transition right at the anastomosis of the afferent loop with its e with the efferent loop and native small bowel. So that's the point of obstruction easily visualized there. Look at how thick walled that bowel is very clearly sick. And there went the focal caliber transition denoting the uh, obstruction. You can see the whole duodenum is dilated up to that point. All right, so that's another afferent loop syndrome, this one with ischemic proximal bowel. All right, a couple of other interesting, um, oops, sorry, a couple of other interesting complications you might not have thought of. Well, this one is nutcracker syndrome. You, of course, we saw a case of SMA syndrome yesterday, and this is a variant on that. This is where patients lose a lot of weight. They lose the mesenteric fat surrounding the SMA, and the space between the SMA and, in this case, the left renal vein diminishes such that you get left renal vein occlusion, and that is nutcracker syndrome as opposed to SMA syndrome. SMA syndrome blocking the gastric outlet, right, at the third portion of the duodenum. The uh, nutcracker syndrome causing left renal vein obstruction. So we've got our bariatric staple line here. And there is the SMA pinching that left renal vein. In addition here, this patient has formed varices that are renosplenic. Now, in most cases, when people have portal hypertension, they'll develop a splenorenal shunt, and we'll be looking at a few of those down the road. But in this case, the shunting is going the, in the opposite direction. It's going from that left renal vein. There are big dilated varices all throughout the uh, lower abdomen that ultimately communicate and transmit the blood back to the splenic vein, which you can see is pretty hefty here, and you'll be able to trace the left renal vein tributaries down, making their communication with the splenic vein and coming back up into the portal system. So there's that dilated left renal vein. And look at the size of these varices. It travels down, communicates then with the portal vein, and comes back up into the splenic vein. So you can track the splenic vein tributary down as well on the patient's left, where it communicates with those varices. So that is a nutcracker syndrome, and it makes perfect sense, right? That you would get a bariatric surgery, then have rapid weight loss, and then develop either SMA or nutcracker syndrome. 